No regrets. No regrets. To those who thought they could destroy you, Nadia Murad's spirit is not broken. Who do we turn to for our people's right to survive? Yes, good evening, oh, evening, afternoon, everybody. Um, we're almost sold out, and that's uh, good to see. Welcome to the Human Rights Watch uh, weekend. Uh, welcome to this masterclass in which we will look, have a look behind the scenes of uh, human rights investigations. How do you find human rights violations? How do you deal with the authorities? Uh, we will get uh, the answers from uh, two guests working in the field in the Middle East. Let me introduce myself uh, first. My name is Jan Eikelboom. I am a, a reporter, a journalist for the Dutch TV program News Uur. Uh, it's a daily program. Every night at 10 o'clock it brings background stories to the news. From the 19, uh, early 1990s until about two years ago, I was covering wars and conflict uh, zones, mostly in the Middle East. Uh, and from my own first-hand experience, uh, I, I know that there is a lot of challenges to bring the truth, the truth uh, to light. Uh, I think the same goes for my two guests today. Uh, these are Omar Shakir. Can you please move to the stage? You may give them a little applause. And <laughs> Belkis Wille. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Belkis, you are the senior researcher in uh, Iraq, and Omar is the Human Rights Watch director in Israel and Palestine. We will, uh, I will talk to them for about an hour, and then we have about half an hour left for uh, all of your uh, questions. Uh, to start with, uh, Belkis, why do you do this job? Um, Let's get straight to the point. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, as you can imagine, um, a question I get asked a lot. And I get asked that question because of the fact that a lot of the work that we do um, looks like it's in vain and that you don't actually see the direct results of, of the work. Human rights work is, 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 is long and slow. It's not like a humanitarian job where you get to prove that you gave out 100 tents or you, you fed 100,000 families. Um, but I think that what, what, what keeps me going is, and if I'm allowed to give one very yeah. short anecdote of that, because I think it, it, it fleshes this out. I used to be the Yemen researcher for Human Rights Watch. I was based in Yemen for three and a half years. And uh, I was covering airstrikes uh, on Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition. And uh, I went up to the north to an area that had been very heavily bombed. And I went to see a house where there had been a large family that had been killed, 24 people in the family, and only three had survived, um, a, a man, his father, and his brother. And then I, I went back to the capital, to Sana'a, and I spent days searching through every single hospital to try and find this man, because I wanted to understand more about what had happened that night. And I eventually found him uh, in, in the hallway in a hospital, and I, and I then was able to sit with him for about an hour, and I spoke to him about uh, not only what happened that night, but also about his family. And uh, he showed me photos of his daughter from the day before the airstrike because it had been her engagement day. She had fallen in love with, their, with the son of their neighbor and he had these photos, these engagement photos and he just kept flipping through them back over and over and that's really all he had left. And to him, the fact that I, some strange foreigner coming out of nowhere, had made the effort to go to his house in the north to document what had happened, to then come back to the capital, spend the day searching for him and then take the time to just listen to him that gave value to the life of his family members who had been lost, that gave value to the suffering that now he and his, his few remaining relatives were going through. And to me, that, that in and of itself is, is, is enough. The fact that I have the ability and the support of the organization to do is, is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Omar? 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you wake up and do this every day, you have to genuinely believe that things can change for the better. Um, and I think that's maybe a naive, but kind of the belief I take with me. I think I decided from a relatively um, young age, I think around the time of college, that I was going to dedicate my life to, to human rights issues generally. And it's always been a question of what issue, what time, what area. And I have this ability, I think, to convince myself that whatever I'm doing at the moment is the most important thing that needs to be done. So whether it was, you know, when I covered Egypt for Human Rights Watch in the, in the midst of mass killings of protesters and the Rabah. 20, the Rabah massacre, um, where we were on the ground for a year documenting Rabah being one of the world's largest single day killings of protesters in modern history, over 800 people killed in a square in the middle of Cairo, whether it was two years um, where um, I, I worked for an organization where I represented two men detained in Guantanamo Bay and was shuttling back and forth doing that, or whether it's been the last two and a half years in this role covering um, Israel-Palestine. And, um, you know, I think, I think ultimately um, we have a lot of privilege, you know, and I feel I, I've, I've, my family's originally from Iraq, but I was born and raised in, in California, and it's never was a choice. I've always felt that it's, you know, that I was doing this work, like and it was always a matter of... Like a duty? Yeah, I mean, just it, it's like nothing I ever thought about. It was always a question of just where, where, where do I think can I, can I have the most impact? Is and it so, also fun? I, 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 think, I think as a human rights watcher, re, re researcher, you have, in my opinion, perhaps not objective on this, really the coolest job in the world. You know, at a time when in the world of media, there's so little money for serious investigative reporting, we at Human Rights Watch have this ability, with the support of an entire organization, to spend, you know, for example, a year documenting a massacre and doing it properly and gathering the evidence in such a methodical way that it really carries power with it, more power than, you know, potentially a short article that has a, a certain lifespan, but then and the, the world forgets about it. So, so I think our job is, is, is really incredible. So let's see how you work. We have a little video clip of you, uh, Belkis. Let's uh, watch it. Nine months after Iraqi forces managed to retake Mosul from ISIS, the level of destruction in the old city is unbelievable. Bodies still litter the streets here. We uncovered a disturbing sight, a room packed with the decomposing bodies of dozens of men. Officials told us these were the bodies of ISIS members. Witnesses who we spoke to last July, in the final weeks of the battle, told us that this building was very close to sites where Iraqi forces had held, tortured, and executed ISIS suspects. Only a few days ago, we discovered at least 40 bodies of men in that room. We asked authorities what they were doing with the bodies. They would not tell us. They were already clearing out as many as they could when we arrived, and they wouldn't share any information. We've come back only a few days later, and the entire room has been burnt. All the evidence of what could potentially be a war crime has been destroyed. Yeah. Iraqi officials should release information regarding where the corpses were taken and allow forensic experts to examine them. The government should take concrete steps to investigate possible evidence of war crimes and hold commanders found guilty accountable. Um, well, what, what I think always surprises people uh, if they see the name of Human Rights Watch and the amount we're cited in the media and by policymakers um, is that actually I think, think our voice is very outsized for, for the size of the, the organization. I mean, we're a tiny organization. We're about 400 individuals around the world. And a quarter of that, 100 of us are the researchers. So since we cover 90 countries in the world, that basically means one researcher per country and then a group of, of, of other researchers who do thematic work. So working on women's rights, refugee rights, business and human rights, LGBT rights. Um, so in, 
in the case of Iraq, uh, b basically the team is me. Now, I've been very lucky um, to get uh, some donor support to allow me to hire a, a local individual uh, who helps me particularly with some of the, the languages that, are, that, that you find in Iraq that I don't speak. I speak Arabic, but I don't speak Kurdish or Turkmen. Um, and so the two of us uh, are able to work together. But as you'll, as you'll see in, in other countries, generally it's, it's just one person, just one researcher. Yes, I mean, yes. <laughs> well, it's also quite small. Um, the dynamics in Israel-Palestine are a bit different um, in terms of access. So, for example, um, the Israeli government since 2008 has only let our international staff into the Gaza Strip one time in the, in the, in the course of a decade. And we're talking about a 40 by 11 kilometer piece of land with 2 million people that's been the site of three major conflicts um, in the last uh, 10 years, in addition to the kind of daily violations that come with living under effectively a closure system. So we have a research assistant that's in Gaza, and she, until a year ago, had never been able to leave Gaza in her entire life. Um, so, you know, she's there. I still haven't been permitted to go in, um, including in just October when the Israeli government denied us a permit to release um, a report about Hamas uh, abuses, including arbitrary arrest and torture. So we have one person who's in Gaza. We have somebody who's in the West Bank, but the person in the West Bank is a Palestinian who has a Palestinian ID. So the Israeli government doesn't allow her to go to Jerusalem um, or into Israel without a permit, which is rarely issued and not given Human Rights Watch. So then we have a third um, uh, person who comes uh, who's an Israeli citizen who covers Israel proper and East Jerusalem. So our team is a bit bigger, but it's a quite similar dynamic, and we're also dealing with basically three authorities, Hamas, the PA, and Israel. So how do you prioritize? I mean, you yeah, that's, that's actually something uh, we think about a lot at, at Human Rights Watch. Um, as you say, when you're one person covering a country with many, many serious human rights issues, uh, you need to be quite strategic and thoughtful about what you pick to work on. And actually, the fact that it's only one person and there's only 24 hours a day means that we really need to, to do that calculus. And, and, and I think that's actually, in a way, a benefit. And so at Human Rights Watch, the way this works is that at the beginning of the year, um, the researcher basically has a discussion with, with the supervisor and lays out three priorities, for example, for the year. And so I'll say to my boss, this coming year in Iraq, these are the three issues or human rights violations I want to work on. And then my boss will say to me, and why do you think us working on this issue this year will actually bring about change? And that's really the, 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 the essence of how we make this choice. We need to be able to show that if we decide to work on an issue, it's because there's a real likelihood of impact. And if there's no likelihood of impact, then it's not the best use of our time uh, during, during that year. And, uh, you know, sometimes the issues that we look at are suddenly um, in a moment where we can see change because you have a new government that comes to power. You have a new push in parliament to pass a law. Or sometimes it's because you've got um, uh, a civil society that's been working for 20, 30 years on an issue. And they come to us and they say to us, if Human Rights Watch lends its voice to this issue that we have been working on for, for decades, that will be able to create the catalyst for change and the tipping point. And so that's really sort of the calculus that we do when we decide what to work on. Sometimes, in very rare occasions, we deviate from, from that. Um, so we, we don't work on something because there's a clear likelihood of impact. And instead, we work on something because we think it is our moral imperative. We are there to document an accurate historical narrative, and that is our obligation as a human rights organization. And, and I think that that really ties into the work that we were doing in, in Iraq, particularly covering abuses by ISIS. Now, ISIS was, among other things, posting videos uh, executing foreign journalists. We did not believe, as Human Rights Watch, that us writing a press release about ISIS killing journalists is going to get ISIS to stop killing journalists. And in fact, ISIS is very happy with the publicity. This was a key element of how they governed areas through, through, through um, publicizing their horrific atrocities scaring and scaring people. And so there, with, with the work we did documenting abuses by ISIS, on the one hand, it was this feeling that we really had an obligation to the victims to create this historical narrative. But, but the other part of it was actually us knowing that there's going to be the day after ISIS, the day when 
the Iraqi system or the international system deny, decides to prosecute the crimes committed by ISIS. And for us to be able to assess whether those prosecutions are correct, whether those prosecutions actually hold people accountable for horrific abuses, the only way we can do that is if we were involved in the documentation of the crimes themselves. And that's really the work that I've been doing now over the last year and a half, monitoring the trials of ISIS suspects across Iraq. And you, Omar, how, how do you prioritize? How do you pick your topics? Yeah, the dynamics are similar and also a bit different in the case of Israel-Palestine. We're talking about a situation um, where the abuses are entrenched. I mean, the occupation has been around for over half a century, where it's relatively well documented. There's a number of, you know, really fantastic local human rights organizations. So we do also try and take on the most serious issues, but I think what I've tried to do in, in this role is to be strategic in thinking about three to five year benchmarks where we can make sort of gradual in, uh, inroads on serious issues. So I've tried to prioritize around thematic areas. So some of those thematic areas, for example, include work on businesses that operate in settlements. And the reason for doing that is, um, is our theory of change really is we've, we've been unable clearly to prevent the Israeli government from building settlements. And we've had mixed success in getting governments to put pressure on Israel to stop building settlements. But we found an ability to actually engage um, private corporations um, and talk to them about their role in benefiting from, profiting from, and contributing to serious rights abuse. We've also done, um, for example, work around arbitrary arrests and torture by the Palestinian Authority and by Hamas authorities in Gaza. And that also stems from a theory of change that um, they receive significant funding funding from, uh, in particular, EU states, including uh, the Netherlands, and by the ability to show that abuses are systematic and by going straight to donors. It's also a value add, a place where we can add to the conversation where other groups are less able to go there. Um, we've also done work around the closure of Gaza, the fact that Gaza has effectively had a generalized travel ban and a closure policy for well over a decade. And that's, I think, um, Belka's put it well, it's, you know, we have, even though it's harder because the Israeli military is really um, the one that's in charge there. It's something we have the imperative to do, and we're always trying to think of new ways to bring attention to the issue. And the last two areas I've really tried to focus on, one is um, gender and sexuality, including LGBT rights, and using the sort of relationships we have, in particular on the Palestinian side, as a way to mainstream um, women's rights, and in particular LGBT rights among Palestinian um, society. And the last area has been really a framework project and thinking about what it means to have a permanent occupation because the entire law that we apply is premised on the idea of occupations being temporary. And then factually, how do you deal with the reality of effectively not only permanent occupation, but entrenched discrimination that um, you know, treats Palestinians unequally wherever they live between um, Israel and Palestine today. Yeah. So you have a topic you want to in investigate, and then how, how does it go? You, you, you go in a car, you take a car, you go. Uh, Belkis, what does a regular day for you uh, look like? So as, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, the days are, are varied, and, it, and they're varied really based on the topic that we're, that we're working on. Uh, Human Rights Watch as an organization, how do we get our information? Our information is always coming from victims themselves of the human rights abuse or first-hand witnesses. So we will never rely on information that we are being provided by another organization, a government. Sometimes organizations will flag an issue to us and say you should be looking into, you know, potentially a massacre that occurred in this area. But then it is our job, my job as the researcher, to go verify what happened with my own eyes and speak to the, to, to, to the victims themselves. And so it, it means a lot of early, early mornings, waking up at 6, 7 in the morning, getting into a car, um, trying to negotiate our way through checkpoints. In Iraq, as you can imagine, there are checkpoints everywhere. They are controlled by many, many different armed actors, which means even if you might have gotten uh, permission from Baghdad, you may not be allowed to go through a certain checkpoint. Um, and then at that point, it's, it's simply getting to the victims. And that means doing a lot of research before we get into that car, figuring out, let's say a, a village was burned. We need to figure out where the people fled to and be able to get to them in a safe manner. And a safe manner means also that we need to make sure we are never traveling with any armed security any government uh, forces, because that would fundamentally jeopardize um, 
the people that we're interviewing and jeopardize our own objectivity. Um, and, and, then I, and then I end up sitting for, for, for hours in the context of Iraq. It's usually in a, in a tent for many, many hours talking to locals within the community, talking to people who've, who've been victim of abuse, usually by armed actors. Um, and and, and the, the purpose of our reports is, are really to capture the words of the victims themselves very directly. That's why in our reports, what you see very often are these very large block quotes. Our reports are there and our videos are there to give a platform and a voice to victims to be able to talk directly to the audience about what they've uh, suffered. Do people necessarily speak the truth? No, I mean, I think part of um, our job as uh, investigators is to get to the reality. In some ways, we're a mix of a investigator, um, you know, the role of a journalist, but also the role of a lawyer, the role of an advocate sort of uh, blended into one. And I think my mentor in law school told me, uh, you know, something that has always stuck with me, which is you're as strong as your weakest fact. And, you know, I, you know, I'll, I'll give the example for report. I, the report I did on the Rabah massacre, right? Um, the mass killings of protesters in Egypt. You know, we were talking about a situation where in 12 hours, the Egyptian forces opened fire on, you know, uh, ten, you know, a group of about 20, 30,000 demonstrators and killed over 800. So we wanted to know how that happened, you know, how that happened. What were the dynamics? So you had to, first of all, um, interview a lot of people and not just a lot of people writ large. You had to go to each of the parts of the protest, this area. I mean, it was a one by half kilometer radius, but in each location at each time of day, you needed multiple accounts because it's not that and people don't always tell the truth, but actually the bigger problem you have is exaggeration or people having a limited perspective on the event and then extrapolating what happened. I'll give you one concrete example. A lot of the, wit the victims of Rabaa told me that they heard uh, that there, were, there was fire from planes up above, right? But I never saw any, so you also have to look at videos and pictures, but I never saw any videos and pictures. And it turned out there were helicopters and there were people out of the window in the helicopters, but they had cameras. They were recording the square. They, but then there was fire from snipers atop the building. So to a normal person, they think they're firing from the helicopters. But in reality, there was fire up above, but it was from snipers. And then there was planes with cameras. But that's a case where you have, even though I think, a dozen or more people told me there was fire from planes. I couldn't corroborate it with independent testimony and I couldn't find it in videos and pictures. So I think corroboration, very detailed questions. So when somebody fires, you want to know, you know, what color is their shirt and, um, you know, where were they standing? And, and it, someone's credibility comes in their ability to retell. It's almost like poli police investigation, right? It is. In that sense, it is. But I'll, I'll take a different, I mean, that's the, the killing examples. Well, let me just maybe take one other example from uh, a report I mentioned around um, Airbnb and booking.com and their listings um, in illegal settlements in the West Bank. In that case, we start with, there's a listing on a website, right? So we found these listings. We needed to find out the addresses. So we engaged hosts, we cross-checked listings, we found specific addresses. Then we worked with an Israeli NGO to actually f look at maps by the Israeli army of the status of the land uh, at that address. We found out some was stolen directly from Palestinians. Um, a number of lands was ones the Israeli army took over, declared state land, then gave to settlers. Then we went to local Palestinian villages and municipalities and looked at the Palestinian land records and found the names of the individual landowners and looked at their property documents. And and that way, we're able to make the connection between a listing on Airbnb and Booking.com and the individual Palestinian landowner. So we had to, we looked at records, we interviewed people, we also engaged the host of the settlement itself, we engaged the company itself. So it's getting all the perspectives and then being able to retell the story in an objective way that highlights the underlying rights abuse. Uh, can you can you afford to make a mistake, Belkis? The short answer is, is no. Uh, Human Rights Watch, the, the reason that our name carries such weight, the reason that you see us cited uh, in the media, whether it's about something going on in Myanmar, um, uh, in terms of persecution of the Rohingya, or chemical weapons attacks in Syria, or in fact, you know, uh, abuses within the criminal justice system in the US, is because of the fact that governments, the media, take our words as truth, as fact. And, and if we ever were to make a mistake, that would be destroyed. And the power of the name of Human Rights Watch and our ability to prevent, present abuses and present facts would, would be lost. So, so within Human Rights Watch, we have a, a, a very serious system of fact checking um, at multiple levels whenever we issue a product. But, but this also um, is, is an area where we're really pushing to uh, use new technologies 
So in Iraq, I've done a lot of work um, on the forensic side when we talk about receiving things like you mentioned, videos, photos that might substantiate um, an allegation of an abuse. We need to be very careful with those. We need to have a forensic analyst look and verify that these videos are accurate. And there are many methods to do that methods that your average person can't do, and that's why we have someone on staff at Human Rights Watch whose expertise is, is, it is to do that. Um, but we're also doing more and more with things like satellite imagery. Satellite imagery allows us to take a look at an area where we physically can't get onto the ground, or if we can't find the individual victims. And it allows us also to look back in time. So I might get to an area, I'll see that a village has now been destroyed, and I want to know why it was destroyed. I know from the victim's testimony roughly when, when the incident occurred. And then we can actually get satellite imagery to show us on that day that they say something happened to their home, what exactly it was. Was it bulldozers? Was it fires? And that's, that's a key way that we can substantiate the actual raw testimony that we get from, from victims. No, you can't make a mistake. Did you ever make a mistake? Not that I know of. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, so you're hearing all these, uh, well, sometimes terrible stories. Uh, how do you deal with that? Um, I think in the, in the human rights movement, we came to an understanding and a recognition of um, the trauma, the, tr the secondary trauma that you can develop from talking to, to, to victims, perhaps a bit later than the media world. I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, major media organizations were realizing that you saw journalists, particularly, you know, war correspondents, who were developing uh, post-traumatic stress disorder at the same rate as, as soldiers on a front line. And as a result, they developed a very uh, robust response to that, to providing um, support for staff. And the human rights field, I think, is, is, is finally catching up with that. And, and as an organization, as Human Rights Watch, I think we're a bit of ahead of the curve compared to other fellow human rights organizations in not only making sure that you know, we have 24-hour counselors who are accessible you know, uh, at any time of day, but also uh, that we really take a, a, a sensitive approach to the fact that on staff we have you know, 120 different nationalities, men, women, different uh, age range who might have a very different way of processing trauma. And so as a result, we need to be able to provide everyone with something that will work for them and give them the option to pick how they, how they respond to, to, to the work that they're doing. So some people don't need uh, to speak to a counselor. They just need to be able to once a year get together with colleagues and spend some quality time together talking about the work that they're doing. Um, so it, it, that's, that's sort of how we, how we approach it. So how do you deal with it? Or is that too, too personal? <laughs> no, I'm happy to address that. I mean, for me, it really is, uh, on the one hand, speaking very regularly to colleagues. To me, talking to peers is, is what I think works best. So talking to colleagues like Omar, you know, we haven't seen each other in months. We're all dispersed around the world, so we only see each other generally once a year in February. We have a big annual meeting at the end of the month in New York. Um, and so when we get opportunities like this, um, we, we spend time catching up with each other, checking in on how the work is going, but on, 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 how, on a personal level, how, how we're doing. Yeah. Does it take, do, do, uh, and how, how do you deal with, deal with it, uh, Omar? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have sort of regular um, ways that you take proper breaks, right? So I think um, there has to be something you do every day. There has to be something you do every hour, really, every day, every week, and every month, and every year. And so I think, you know, uh, you know, for me in the evening, I often try and, you know, whether it be um, think about sports or something completely different, or a lot of times I'll do sort of word games or things where I use my brain but completely sort of disconnected from the everyday work. I try um, uh, in, in, in Jerusalem and in the, in the West Bank the past year and a half, I do a hike almost every week can like go outdoors and you get fresh air and you're completely disconnected at least once a month I try and go to a different part of Israel Palestine just be on a beach somewhere and then yeah I think every quarter or so take a proper vacation and then uh, every six months to a year you know a couple of weeks uh, where you really um, unplug and, and try and really stay away from your email and um, stay out of the work so I think it has to be that you have to have approach that is every day, every week, and, and gives yourself space to breathe. Do, do you need to be a special type of personality to do this, this work? 
So I, when I when I first started doing human rights work, it was actually in Gaza, and and I remember once I was interviewing a man who had lost his family in in Operation Castled, which was a military operation, an Israeli operation on Gaza in December two thousand eight to January two thousand nine. And I remember it was a very difficult interview, and he started crying, uh, of course, because he's lost his family. And I couldn't stop myself either. And, and it, was, um, it was a difficult experience for me. I, I went home that day, and I, I basically said to myself, that if, if this is going to be my reaction every time I interview someone, then I can't continue mm -hmm. doing this work. If I want to continue doing this work, and I do, I need to figure out a way of being able to on the one hand, continue to deeply empathize with the people that I'm interviewing, and I do, but at the same time be able to take a step back, interview someone, get the facts that I need in a calm and composed way. And I mean, uh, as, as Omar was saying, in a way we need to play the, the lawyer and we need to make sure that everything that someone is telling us it can stand up essentially in a court of law. That's the standard we, so you we also try have to, to maintain. Uh, pose hard questions to people, to victims. Exactly. I mean, we have at Human Rights Watch, um, we have an, a whole manual around uh, how to properly interview victims um, of torture, of sexual violence, in a way that we are ensuring that we're not causing them any secondary trauma. That's something we're very, very worried and conscious of, and that's why we take a lot of measures to, to avoid that. Um, so we're careful in how we ask questions, and yet we need to make sure we have the yeah. facts. And in some ways, one of the harder things, and I, I felt this particularly when I was going back and forth to Guantanamo, is I would leave Guantanamo Bay, and then I would suddenly be in New York or Washington and out to dinner with my friends, and like I'm back to normal life, and my client is still stuck there in the base. I'm sitting here in Amsterdam speaking to all of you and probably think, oh, they do cool work, but like the people we interview are not out of that reality. So there's something about the disconnect between sort of being in this kind of place and then the kind of reality of the field. I don't think there's one kind of personality, but I think people have different ways for me. I hate people getting away with stuff. That's been like deep in my DNA. So like I, when I'm investigating an abuse, like I want the person who did it, I just, I, I get very competitive, right? I, I want them to pay a cost for doing it. So I become sort of on a mission to make the person pay a cost for doing that. Mm. So, And then you're not the nicest person. Uh, ah, yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. No, no, he's a great guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, um, you got a, in trouble, right? With the uh, Israeli authorities. <laughs> Let's look. <laughs> a good transition right there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at, uh, to, to, to a little video clip. One year after granting me a work permit to take up my post on the ground as Human Rights Watch's Israel and Palestine director, the Israeli government has ordered me to leave the country. They say they're deporting me because I publicly support calls for boycotts of Israel. Israel claims to be the region's only democracy, yet it's deporting a rights defender over his peaceful expression, joining the ranks of countries like Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela, who have blocked access to Human Rights Watch staff. Human Rights Watch has offices in Lebanon, Jordan, and Tunisia. More to the point, the claim isn't true, as the Interior Ministry itself acknowledged that neither Human Rights Watch nor I as its representative promote boycotts of Israel. Instead, the government based its decision on an intelligence dossier on me compiled by the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which included such evidence as screenshots of student group websites, tweets, and petitions I signed, most of which date back years to when I was a student at Stanford University. We filed a lawsuit to challenge this decision and the draconian law it was based on. This action, rather, is the culmination of a months-long campaign by the government to shut down our criticism of its human rights record. This isn't the first time a country has barred me from entry for my criticism. In 2009, Syria denied me a visa after an official said that my writing reflected poorly on the government. In 2014, I was forced to leave Egypt after I wrote a report documenting the Rab'a massacre, one of the world's largest single-day killings of protesters in modern history. A year ago, Bahrain held me for 18 hours and denied me entry after I identified myself as working for Human Rights Watch. If I've learned anything from these experiences, it's this. No country will succeed in hiding its human rights abuses by expelling those who document them. Okay.
Applause for the bad boy. <laughs> um, what's it like now? Yeah, so we're still um, stuck in court. I'm here because I have a permission slip from the Israeli government that says I'll be allowed re-entry. Um, that video was taken. Yeah, you can see that, sign, that picture out there. Basically, they, the government gave me 14 days to leave the country. Um, and the day before I was due to leave, the court um, issued an injunction in May of 2018, freezing enforcement of the decision until the end of legal proceedings. Uh, we've been in court since. We had a hearing in June. Um, and the government has sort of been delaying a little bit. Last month, they decided to continue to insist on my deportation. They filed a 120-page new brief in our case, um, and I'm due back in court March 11th. At that point, the court will either decide um, that the government's deportation order is valid, in which case I'll have to leave the country, or they'll rule in our favor and reinstate um, my work permit. Of course, you know, this is just the latest iteration of a long campaign. In February of 2017, two years ago, uh, the Israeli government denied Human Rights Watch the right to hire a foreign employee, claiming that we were propagandists for the Palestinians. Um, clearly not great propagandists, as you've seen from some of our uh, reports, um, and, uh, and basically said we were not a real human rights group. We put pressure. They ultimately relented. I moved to the country uh, April 2017, the day after I moved there. Uh, a right-wing organization with ties to the government, um, in fact, whose social media manager is uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's son, su um, sued the government in court, claiming that they violated the law that denies entry to alleged supporters of boycotts by allowing uh, me in. That case in court led to a review, which resulted in the decision you saw as the backdrop to the video. So it's just the latest chapter in this. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, we continue to do our work and we'll continue to document um, regardless. Did you did you call for boycotts? Uh, Human Rights Watch uh, and I do not take a position on uh, the BDS movement or on boycotts. What we do do is document abuses that corporations um, uh, make in settlements, right? We hold corporations like we do governments to account for their own practices. Um, and we have a position that any company that does business in or with settlements is inherently benefiting from and contributing to serious violations of human rights. But our call is to a company to stop operating. We don't have calls to consumers. Um, and, um, you know, much more fundamentally, you know, we don't take a position on you know boycotts like we don't on wars or occupations our job is to be a, an actor that calls on all sides in a conflict to adhere to their legal obligations so why do they want to kick you out I mean, is it uh, it's, a personal thing or is it uh, against Human Rights Watch? It's it's really a clear effort to muzzle our criticism um, of their rights record. And it's not unique to us, right? This is all happening at the same time that Israel has denied um, entry to many other rights activists. Um, Amnesty International, for example, released a report last week also on tourism and settlements. And immediately an Israeli minister said they're going to look to kick Amnesty out of the country. Israeli rights organizations have been accused of slandering the arms army in the state. Palestinian rights defenders have it worse. They've been faced criminal charges, arrest, detention, etc. So um, it's a climate right now where um, the space, I mean, I would say is shrinking, but is really, I mean, really is shrinking and evaporating. And it's not, of course, just the Israeli government, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas are doing the same yeah. thing when it comes to criticism of their rights record. Yeah, I, I was just about to ask, the Palestinians aren't any better? Palestinian Authority, Hamas, the starting point is they have very little actual authority. I mean, today, in, in between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea and modern-day Israel-Palestine, the Israeli government really is the primary ones in charge. But the areas in which there's limited Palestinian self-rule, the, the Palestinian Authority really and Hamas have both carried themselves out as effectively police states. Um, you know, we did a report in October, a 149-page report that documented the way in which people are systematically being arrested for criticism on Facebook, right? for writing a journalist who writes a critical news article, a university student that's affiliated with a group that's uh, opposing the government. So in the West Bank, if you're seen as sympathetic to Hamas, in, in Gaza, if you're seen as sympathetic to Fatah, and then, you know, people who attend demonstrations um, live in certain areas that are seen as opposing the government. So unfortunately, Palestinians are stuck between several authorities intolerant of dissent. And in fact, in the West Bank, Palestinians 
we've documented a number of cases in which Palestinians are detained by the Palestinian Authority and by the Israeli government on the same set of allegations. So they cycle between both of their detention, right? So this is the reality that Palestinians stuck between these authorities face. Uh, and how, how are the Palestinian authorities dealing with Human Rights Watch as an organization? Um, you know, it's, we've had our challenges as well. Um, you know, before we released our report in October regarding um, abuses by the Palestinian Authority, for example, they released a statement in which they said this was part of Trump's deal of the century. It was part of pressure that was being put on the PA as part of a, you know that um, agenda. We've previously had a member of our staff who was. Um, uh, detained and beaten in, in the custody of the Palestinian Authority. Um, so we face security challenges. Uh, in Gaza as well, I mean, our, our larger access has been not being able to get in. Um, but uh, we're always very conscious of the security of our colleague who's based there, because unlike other situations, you know, uh, for, for Belkis and I, if we were to face some sort of serious security threat, we could we could leave. Well, most of the time we can leave. But, um, you know, our, our colleague in Gaza who, you know, effectively lives in, in an open air prison. Right. I mean, it's been under full closure for over a decade. We don't have that ability to pull her out. So we have to regularly make calculations she's regarding Palestinian. she's Palestinian from Gaza, lived there her whole life. And we have to regularly make decisions about what she can and can't work on, what might expose her to threat and what might not. Does that mean that she sometimes cannot work on a certain topic? Absolutely. It's too dangerous. Absolutely. I mean, she she was our lead researcher on the Hamas abuses in the report we released in October, for example. But um, we've had to think of different ways, for example, to document um, executions by by Qassam, the armed wing um, of, um, of of Hamas. Also, when we did a report documenting the disappearances of two Israeli civilians with mental health conditions by uh, Hamas authorities, we didn't involve her in the research at all. We did the research in different sort of ways, which which I can talk about um, outside of the country. And, and similar things when we talk about rockets that are fired by Palestinian armed groups, we don't involve her in that part of the work at all. Uh, so is it fair to say that in Israel, Palestine, from the viewpoint of human rights, that there's no, no good guys? When it comes to the authorities, there absolutely um, is uh, no one who has a, a clean record. Um, but there are good guys, which are really the human rights defenders on the ground. Yeah. There are amazing Israeli and Palestinian human rights groups, our partners um, in this work, groups on the Israeli side like Beth Salem, Breaking the Silence, Akri, Gisha on the Palestinian side, Al Mizan, the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, Al Haq, um, Al Damir, that are doing incredible work and they face much greater um, challenges and threats than we do. How does Iraq compare to Israel-Palestine, Belkis? Um, it, it, diff, different in, in different ways. I mean, just picking up on what Omar was speaking about, when you talk about uh, civil society, local civil society, that's able to do extremely important work, that's able to work um, and, 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 and back up some of the, the allegations that we're making, in Iraq you don't, you don't have that. You have a weakened civil society. It was it was weak under Saddam, and it has always been weak since then. Um, the money for organizations only ever comes from political parties. So organizations that call themselves NGOs are actually essentially a fund by a political party to work on a politicized issue. Um, on the on the security side, uh, the the difference I think with Iraq is that you have even more security actors involved. So, uh, you know, in, if you're sitting in Baghdad, you're dealing directly with, with, with the federal government. But the minute you leave Baghdad, some parts of the country are entirely run by armed groups that may, for many years, have been uh, very closely tied to neighboring Iran. Um, now, since November 2016, all of these groups are on paper answering to the prime minister. But in reality, they do not answer to the prime minister. And some of these groups still do answer, answer directly to Iran. These are the, um, the so-called Shia militias, right? Yes. Yeah. Or the their formal name are, are the Popular Mobilization Forces. There are many of them. They commit very serious abuses, extrajudicial killings torture, running of secret prisons. I mean, they really are, 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 are gangs and, and thugs, uh, some of these groups. Um, and, then, and then in other areas, you've had this proliferation of other armed forces. You have Sunni groups, Sunni tribal forces that have very little command and control structure, very little training, but weapons. Um, and then uh, in the pushback uh, in areas after ISIS, what you also had was a desire by particularly the US-led coalition to arm other groups. So now you have Christian militia. 
you've got Shabak militia, you've got Yazidi militia. And these groups are also running around without any checks and balances and have been also implicated in very serious abuses, including um, uh, the Yazidi, Yazidi armed forces uh, executing a group of 52 individuals from families, women and, and children, because they were taking revenge for, for, for acts that they thought these families had supported. So. We, we have to be very careful at all times when we're moving around, knowing in the area that we're going to which armed groups are in control. And uh, on a practical side, if, for example, I get arrested at a checkpoint, who is it that I can call? And who at Human Rights Watch knows exactly where I was at the moment that I was taken so that they can respond accordingly? So you have a security plan? Yes. Um, so, so we have a security director sitting in London before any travel that I do anywhere in Iraq, we have a phone call where I essentially lay out the area I'm going to, the reason why I want to go, uh, and what the risks are. And then the second part of the conversation is how can we mitigate those risks as best we can. And there's a point in the discussion where we'll decide whether we're comfortable with continuing with this research, given that we think we can mitigate the risks to a certain extent. Um, then when I proceed and, and, and travel to that area, my, my director sitting in London actually has a very extensive list of contacts of people in the area, people in Baghdad, individuals who could be called upon to step in if they needed to. I also have a GPS tracker on my phone that's directly connected to, to my colleague in London so he knows where I am at, at absolutely all times. Um, I have a panic button on my phone sort of that's, that's um, disguised so that if I get pulled over at a checkpoint, I can, I can press it and it actually turns on a, uh, the, my microphone so that it captures 30 seconds before, let's say, my phone got taken away so that my colleague can, can hear what was happening at the time. Did you ever turn back because it was too dangerous or it felt too dangerous? Um, I've definitely been in instances where um, authorities, armed forces, have stopped us at a checkpoint. And it was clear they didn't want to let us through. We could have pushed harder. We might have gotten through. But I make a decision that it's not a good idea to do so. And in fact, I'm getting the sense that because of the uh, vigor with which they're trying to push us back, there is a reason that we shouldn't proceed. So, so, that, so that has happened. Yeah. Is it more, more difficult to criticize the so-called good guys, the Kurds, for example? Yes. I mean, in, in Iraq, the, the challenge that you face is, first, more generally, when it comes to the Iraqi forces, um, the Americans, the Brits, all EU member states have poured a lot of money into arming and equipping Iraqi forces. Um, as a result, none of them are too keen on the idea that these Iraqi forces actually also commit war crimes in the, in, in the way that ISIS d d did and, and does. Um, and, and more broadly speaking, you know, in the battle against ISIS, anyone who fights ISIS is seen as the good guy. And when we talk about these uh, Iranian-backed groups, the Popular Mobilization Forces, they were fighting ISIS and they were carrying up arms against ISIS. And as a result, also within uh, public opinion, they represent the good guys yeah. in the battle because they were fighting ISIS. In northern Iraq, as you said, you also have the Kurds. So in northern Iraq, part of the territory is an autonomous region, the, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And there you've got Kurdish forces that were um, supported by many, uh, again, the US and EU member states, including Germany particularly. Um, these forces are not, are, are not with a clean record. In fact, um, I know that you've done reporting on the topic and, and we've written an extensive report on Kurdish forces systematically destroying Sunni Arab villages in an effort to make fundamental demographic change and to remove Sunni Arabs from the Kurdistan region of Iraq. They used the excuse of fighting ISIS in order to do that, but it was very blatant, it was systematic, and it was a war crime. Um, when we present findings like that to the Germans, to the Americans, they're not interested in following up with the same vigor that they are when it comes to an abuse uh, by ISIS, because the Kurds to them are seen as an ally in the battle. Yeah. How important is it, Omar, to investigate both sides, like the Israeli and the Palestinian, and, and do you balance? It's critical. I mean, we never, we don't have a bean counter. It's not, you know, okay, we did an Israel one, we're going to do a Palestine one, right? But, the, you know, you want to reflect the reality on the ground. And I think um, the reality on the ground, unfortunately, here is that um, all parties uh, commit abuses. Uh, and we think very carefully, of course, about, um, you know, what we choose to work on. Um, and it's part of our mandate. If we're ever, you know, seen as, as, as sort of more on one side or the other, you lose that, the credibility that you have. And so in the case of 
um, Israel Palestine. We've done work on on all all the different authorities. We have different ways of access and engagement. Of course, I think with with uh, with the Israeli government for for nearly three decades, we we engage them. Things have sort of changed in the past couple of years, um, where we've had less ability to engage them directly um, with Hamas authorities in Gaza. When we're able, when we've been able to go, we've been able to meet them, but we haven't been able to go for a long time. So a lot of it is exchange of letters, is you know phone calls, etc. With the Palestinian authority. We, we you know we can still meet them and we can, and we can still go. Um, the, you know the question is to what extent do they actually listen and follow um, our recommendations? But I think we take very seriously our, our obligation to be really fair uh, evaluators of the reality on the ground. And I don't think any fair evaluator will not see um, the way in which the different um, authorities all are committing abuses. Yeah, it's 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 hard work. It's difficult. It's sometimes dangerous. Uh, is it worth it? I think I think it's worth it. I mean, I think one, I think Belkis's story was very powerful to start with. I mean, you know, just just to be able to be a witness uh, to to this, to be able to listen to somebody who's gone through something and who, who who might be around a society or a group of people where they you know they can't even talk about it or they can't share it, and to have somebody come and listen. I think at the smallest level, I think that is something. And even when there's nothing else, for example, when we were documenting Rabah, you know, the victims of that massacre not only never got accountability for those that committed the crime, but it was even, you know, became criminalized to even talk about the massacre. So, and then you start questioning what you experienced and lived. And, and thankfully, groups, including us, were able to document that reality and that had a huge value. But of course, sometimes we're able to have um, impact and, and change things. And sometimes it's hard to see in the moment. Uh, sometimes you're shifting a conversation or you're maybe changing the calculus of an actor in ways that aren't always tangible. But sometimes, you know, we do, we're, we are able to get concrete um, impact in, in the immediate term. But most of the time, you're thinking about uh, the kind of larger um, long-term horizon and spectrum and, and making inroads. And you keep pushing and pushing and you keep, you know, doing so and eventually walls fall down. I, I don't really want to demoralize you, but does it really have an impact? I mean, when you look at Egypt, for example, Sisi is still uh, strong in uh, in power. When you look at Yemen, you had this heartbreaking story in the beginning of your talk, but I mean the war is still going on. So maybe if I if I may give give one one very specific example, um, it, it's it's also in, on the topic of Yemen. So when I arrived in Yemen, uh, I, I arrived there in 2013 as the first human rights watch researcher to be working on and in Yemen. That that was new for us, um, and it was a, at a moment where you had had a change in government. So with the Arab Spring, you had a, a president who had been in power for 33 years in Yemen step down. He was given complete immunity and impunity for the crimes he committed over those 30. 33 years, but you had a new government and you had an initiative to draft a new constitution. And I arrived in Yemen and it was my job to figure out pretty quickly what issues we should be working on. Where, where, was, our, where was our value in, in the Yemeni context in that moment? And two weeks into my arrival in, in, in Sana'a, in the capital, I received a phone call from a woman who I had met at a conference a week before, um, a gynecologist, a female gynecologist, and she called me, it was in the morning, and she was sobbing. And she told me that the night before, she had been called into the emergency room because there was an eight-year-old girl. She had been married that night to a 52-year-old man, and she had bled to death on her wedding night. As you can imagine, when you hear something like that, um, the, the first reaction is, is utter shock. Um, and that was the moment for me that I decided, if I'm going to do one thing in this country, it's going to be trying to promote the rights of women and girls. That's, that is our value in this country at this moment. As some of you might know, annually there are sort of uh, an index that's done of where, where it's best and worst to be a woman in the world, and Yemen is systematically on the bottom of that list. Not only do you have institutionalized and, and cultural discrimination against women, but add to that it's the poorest country in the Middle East. So you have all the additional factors of poverty that make women and girls even more victim and vulnerable. And, um, and so, so what did we do with that? We went out and did uh, the typical sort of human rights watch thing, which was uh, interviewing families, particularly families who were forced because of poverty to s essentially sell their daughters into marriage. Uh, Yemen is a country where the 
younger the girl is and the older the man is, so the bigger the age difference, the more money the family of the girl will receive. So there's an incentive for girls to be younger and younger going into marriage. And, um, and, and so we interviewed families, particularly families who had lost their daughters, daughters who had died on their wedding night or at birth. And we gave them a platform to express the extent to which this practice was destroying families and Yemen, Yemeni society and communities. That was the report. And in that report, we, of course, focused also on the human, the human rights violation in and of itself and um, the medical reasons why this is such a, a terrible practice. But then in addition to that report, we supplemented it with a video. And this video was atypical for Human Rights Watch. It didn't have sort of, you know, me as the foreigner, the country researcher, talking about what the Yemeni people should do. Instead, it was a platform for this gynecologist that I mentioned, for other doctors, and for religious leaders to talk very directly to the Constitutional Drafting Committee and say, this practice is destroying our society and we need to address this now and we need to address it in the Constitution. Because a law can be changed very easily, but something in the Constitution will be harder to change in, in, in the long term. After that, I embarked on a nine-month uh, process with a very strong group of female uh, activists who had been working for decades on women's rights in Yemen, Yemeni women. And we built a coalition and we did advocacy with the Constitutional Drafting Committee for their nine months. At the beginning, the discussions were very difficult. They absolutely refused to consider putting this in the Constitution. And at the end of nine months, the draft Constitution said in it, in black and white, the minimum age for marriage in Yemen for, for men and for women is 18. Now that is higher than most countries in the world, including Europe, including the US, including here in the Netherlands. And that's uh, one of the, the best days no. I've had at Human Rights Watch. It's, it's an incredible uh, moment and experience to have. The very sad sort of postscript to the story is that just at that time, the civil war began and then the bombing campaign um, precipitated from that. So that draft constitution was taken to the president but was never signed. Mm -hmm. So what we really hope is that at the end of, of this horrific and, 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 and longstanding war, this document comes out because right now there is no new constitution in Yemen. There will be a discussion at the, at the end of this what, what constitution to pass and I really hope that, that this document gets passed. Yeah. Omar, when did you feel your work had the most impact? I don't think I can follow that, so I don't know. Maybe I'll just uh, I'll skip the question. Um, but um, you know, I, maybe I'll give an example of our focus institutionally on businesses and settlements um, for some time, right? I mean, the issue here is half century of occupation. Settlements are a war crime, a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Over six hundred thousand settlers who live in a separate and unequal system where they move freely. Citizens of Israel, whereas Palestinians can't move, aren't citizens, can't vote, face a military occupation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Different resource access, etc. And so we've been trying for a number of years to focus on the role of businesses, including Dutch and American and other businesses, and abetting, aiding and abetting abuses uh, in the West Bank. We wrote a report in January of 2016 called Occupation Inc., which laid out our position of, of why any business who operates in settlements benefits from and contributes to rights abuses. We've done several focused campaigns. One company we engaged with um, for some time was Airbnb and Booking.com. Booking.com is a Dutch company. Um, um, regarding the fact that they had listings in settlements, right? Which means that Airbnb and Booking are brokering rentals on land confiscated from Palestinians who themselves can't stay there because under Israeli military law, Palestinians can't, Palestinian ID holders can't enter settlements except as laborers bearing special permits. So imagine you're a Palestinian, you're kicked out of your home, a settlement is built uh, in this area and eventually it's put on Airbnb and not only have you been kicked out of your property, and, you, and, and some in some cases, we found landowners that had the, the property document that the Israeli go government recognized as saying they were the owners. So they've been kicked off, not have access to their farmlands. They're, they live in an unequal system where they have none of the rights of the people who live in that settlement. And even if they wanted to go on Airbnb or <laughs> Booking.com to rent their own property, they couldn't do so because Israeli military law wouldn't allow them in. And it was the only area in the world, as far as we could find, where Airbnb literally hosts, even if they wanted to let Palestinians stay there, 
couldn't do so, where somebody was effectively denied because of their national or ethnic origin. In one case, it was a Palestinian American who had an American passport, but because he also had a Palestinian ID, couldn't stay in the land that he owned. So just on the eve of us, the day before we released our report, Airbnb, and, and so we had engaged Airbnb for two years. We a year of that engagement, we didn't write, have any plans to write a report. We had hoped that we could make the case they should change their policy. Um, in late 2017, they basically told us, we're not changing our policy. Sorry, our, we're changing the world. We're opening up our homes. We create dialogue and bridges between people. You guys sort of don't get it. As long as it's not um, illegal under local law, we don't care. And, um, you know, they also said, uh, you know, for example, our anti-discrimination policy only applies in the EU and the United States. If you live anywhere else, <laughs> Airbnb's anti-discrimination policy doesn't apply. So we said, OK. And we started doing the research, the methodology, which I described earlier. Uh, we, we presented the report to them. And uh, the day before we were due to release, they issued a statement on an obscure corner of their website that they were going to be delisting um, from the listings and settlements. And it was part of a commitment to a universal policy to have human rights standards in situations of occupation. Um, and so we're continuing, of course, to engage Airbnb to implement their policy and do it globally. And we're working with Booking.com, whose office is around the corner, who continues to have listings and settlements. Okay, Omar, thank you very much. Belkis, very, thank you very much. Uh, we have about half an hour left for all your questions, so uh, who wants to ask a question to these people? Somebody over there. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Harutz. Uh, I have a question for uh, Berkis. Um, I was trying to figure out how complementary is your research work with the investigative uh, research of um, other international institutions, like, for example, the ICC, the International Criminal Court. I know that sometimes your reports are being used by them. And for Omar, actually, I got inspired by your picture with the guy from Al Jazeera. And uh, I was wondering uh, if, uh, I mean, considering the huge soft power that uh, Al Jazeera has in the area, and uh, how much they are talking about the situation in Palestine, and the fact that, for sure, we cannot take... Um, for granted the fact that another media outlet like uh, um, Al Arabiya is um, an unbiased one. I was just wondering if there is a way to understand how the situation is in Qatar when it comes to human rights, because the few um, information that we get when it comes to human rights situation are usually linked with uh, the preparation of the um, World Cup. But then apart from that, there is nothing going on. So. You're lucky that uh, Belkis, in addition to being our rock researcher, is our Qatar researcher. So <laughs> I'll pass that to her. Um, so, so on your on your first question, as you noted, uh, sometimes reports that we've written actually, because as I mentioned, you know, the aim that we have when we write a report is that the the the, the facts and information are so strong that they could stand up in court, and sometimes they do stand up in court. In, in, specifically. So in, in, in terms of um, the prosecution of Mladic uh, before the ICC, our, um, our report, one of the reports that a colleague of mine wrote, that was one of the key pieces of evidence used in the, in the prosecution. Um, we've had uh, other reports used also in European countries in local courts. So for example, we wrote a report uh, about a massacre that happened in Latakia in Syria. That report was one of the key pieces of evidence to prosecute a man who had come as a refugee to Germany who had been instrumental in carrying out that massacre. So those are ways in which the reports themselves um, lend them, that lend themselves to prosecutions. Um, sometimes we appear as, as key witnesses in the cases. That doesn't happen very frequently. Um, and, and the tension there is, you know, a lot of the reports that we write, particularly in a case like Iraq, are reports where the people that we interviewed ask us to remain anonymous and ask us to protect their identity. And that's information that we, that we have to respect. And that is so intrinsic to the work that we do. And that's the kind of information that we, we can't be compelled to provide and provide publicly because that would fundamentally put people at risk. And we aren't able to guarantee the protection of, of individuals if, if they've spoken to us anonymously and that name, name comes out. Um, on, on Qatar, and I think your question also talked a bit about, uh, about independence of the media and you know sometimes i think remarkably when you look at uh, for example the work we do on yemen you'll see that if we write about 
you know, a Saudi coalition bombing of Yemen will be picked up in all of the Hezbollah press outlets, all the Iranian outlets. Um, and then if we write about abuses uh, by the other side, by the Houthis, you know, then immediately we're on Al Arabiya because they, you know, they love that we're that we're covering um, the, the, the other abuses. And, and we have to deal with that. We have to um, use opportunities like that, interviews like that, live on TV to make sure that we add in the interview that we are documenting abuses by, by all sides. In terms of the work that we do in Qatar, as you said, a lot of it is linked very directly to migrant workers' rights, whether it's construction workers, and there, there is a direct tie to preparations for the World Cup, but also uh, migrant domestic uh, workers. So in Qatar, there has been a huge push, including with, with pressure from, from FIFA and others, to make sure that construction workers' rights are improved. But one group of people that get, gets completely ignored from this are migrant domestic workers. Migrant domestic workers are kept out of the labor law. They are explicitly excluded from the labor law, and so they aren't governed by the same protections. Um, in, in terms of free speech in Qatar, you know, this, the space is, is small. There was one sort of opposition media outlet that was uh, uh, taken offline. Their website wasn't accessible inside Qatar. The government reversed that, but they only reversed that after the media outlet was taken over by a group of friends of the government. So symbolically, now there aren't websites being blocked in Qatar, but by the same token, you don't have local um, websites or, or media outlets that are critical of the government. So the space is, is small. I'll just add a quick uh, thing on the media point, which is we make a point actually as Human Rights Watch. If we're invited on RT or Russia Today, we make a point of contacting our Russia colleague to say, okay, how can we link this topic uh, to, to Russia and, and sort of bring in a message that maybe that audience doesn't want to hear or Israel, uh, Israel I-24, which is, tends to be pro-government. When colleagues go on other topics, they'll reach out to me and say, okay, how can we make a point here about, about Israeli rights abuse? So we try and use the platform we're given as a way to sort of get a message that maybe the audience uh, is different than what the, the, the kind of controlled censor wants to get out there. That's interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Many other questions. Hi, I have a question for Omar. Um, I wanted to ask what you thought the role of Egypt should be, particularly as a neighbour, uh, especially in Gaza, for uh, holding human rights abuses accountable, and whether I know that Velka said you present things to Germany and to America. Do you also take that to Egypt and ask them to step up? About Gaza, specifically in Palestine? Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I mean, I think we've, we were always clear in our Gaza-related publications that Gaza play, uh, that Egypt plays an important role. Um, the role is different, right? So, I mean, the reason we focus on the Israeli closures is because Israel, according to UN, ICRC, us, is still the occupying power in Gaza. Israel controls the airspace, the water space. They control who comes in and out. They control what goods come in and out. They have blocked the building of an airport or a seaport. They control the, every baby born in Gaza today is still registered by Israel, they control the value add tax, a buffer zone around the board. I mean, go on and on and on. So Egypt is distinct because under international law, it's not, not it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate border, right, between two entities. And under international law, unfortunately, you know, I mean, states have some degree of control over a, a, a border between nations. So the nature of the obligation, Israel as an occupier is uh, under the um, Hague resolutions must provide for the provision of civilian life in, a, in an occupied territory. Egypt doesn't have that obligation, but what Egypt is doing is essentially being complicit in the underlying violation that Israel is carrying out. So we, we try and focus on Egypt's role in furthering the underlying abuse um, that takes place there. And certainly, you know, Egypt has kept until about May of 2018, from the period of around 2014 summer, when uh, uh, actually 2013, going back to the toppling of the Mohammed Morsi government, until about May of 2018, they largely kept Rafah, their border with Gaza, sealed. It's been opened more in the last nine months as, as a way of kind of relieving the pressure around the demonstrations that took place. Um, but still, Egypt's role has been largely um, unproductive, to put it lightly, when it comes to Gaza. Okay, I saw a question there as well. <clears throat> Hi, I also have two questions, if I may, for Omar. Uh, one is, um, it is now 25 years ago, more even, since the Oslo Accords were signed, and since then the international community has actually only promoted a two-state solution. 
which with the increasing number of Israeli settlements does not seem very realistic anymore. What is your opinion on the possibility for one state solution, so one democratic state which would then not be Jewish? Um, and the other one is related to Gantz, uh, who as Netanyahu's main oppon opponent in the upcoming elections, um, has recently published some uh, videos for his campaign in which he's basically bragging about how many people he has killed while he is being sued in the Netherlands for war crimes uh, by a Dutch Palestinian citizen who lost his family in the 2014 uh, bombings. How do you see this uh, evolving in the coming months and the impact that it might have? Sure. So actually, it's, they are good questions because they allow me to make a bigger point about Human Rights Watch, which is, you know, we don't take a position on solutions, right? So we have no um, organizational position on one state or two state solution. What we do have an opinion on is that whatever solution happens, it must be one grounded on respect for international law and human rights. And the problem with both solutions, let's start with the two state solution, is that so much of the conversation now has been let's have a let's have a two state solution because we you know it's the solution or let's separate people but not because for example settlements are a violation of international law or settlements entail are, are built on confiscated palestinian land or settlements are in, inextricably linked to the establishment of a separate and unequal two tiered discriminatory system that treats palestinians unequally in the west bank right it's become a solution that is devoid of a problem <laughs> in some ways um, and of course, there's many different versions. The reality on the ground today is a one state reality. We say that all the time. It's a one, uh, one state reality of unequal rights, right? So today, if you take Palestine and Israel together, you know, so West Bank, Gaza, and Israel, you have about 13 million people. You have six and a half million Israeli Jews and six and a half million Palestinians, more or less. The numbers are slightly variable. And fundamentally, if you're a Palestinian, you're receiving unequal rights. And uh, it's a different basket of unequal rights, depending on whether you're a citizen of Israel, you're a Jerusalemite, you're a West Bank, area A, B, C, or whether you're in Gaza. So whatever solution we have needs to start from the point that we have a one state reality of unequal rights. Either a two state or a one state or any other solution could be compatible with um, you know, uh, could be a way forward, but it has to be one that's built on the basic principle that everyone deserves um, equal rights. And that's a fundamental principle, right? Um, on the question of Gantz also, you know, we, we don't take a, a position, obviously, on political candidates. And Gantz has also had other statements in the press. So yesterday, he had a statement about wanting to remove some settlements. And so it's been uh, taken the other way, right? So I think um, the bottom line reality, unfortunately, if the nature of uh, the political discourse in Israel, it's one where no longer, uh, it seems that concerns about international law, um, about Israel's policy, it's, it's half century long, ugly and brutal military occupation are really the focus, right? Increasingly, in fact, it's gone the opposite way, right? So when uh, Defense Minister Lieberman resigned from the government of Netanyahu, it was, be it was based on the idea that we, we didn't do enough uh, use enough force in Gaza, right? They were taking too soft of a policy, um, you know, around uh, around Gaza. So I think it's unfortunate that's the, the nature of the discourse within Israel today. I think the discourse is changing in other parts of the world. Um, I, I, I have some level of optimism about um, uh, some of the changes in the United States and even in Europe, but that hasn't translated, unfortunately, to the scene in Israel. And, and this election conversation, I think, exemplifies that. A uh, question for the both of you, maybe first Belkis and Omar. Uh, you've both studied law, and I would like to know how your university education pans out in everyday uh, research and work, um, and if you could have studied something different and still be in the same place. So I think the most valuable thing that I did in my um, in my undergraduate degree, I, I did my, my college degree in the U.S. So so it's a, a situation in which you can major in one topic but then take other topics at the same time. The most valuable thing I did was actually study a language, and it was to study Arabic. And that's because at the time I had taken a course on the anthropology of human rights and the history of the human rights movement. And as I saw it, and this was much before the Arab Spring it looked to me like the next area where you might have a big opening to do human rights work would be in the Middle East, and that's why I chose to study Arabic. That is, I'd say, 99% of the reason that I am where, where I am today, because of that language skill. I subsequently um, graduated, I went to law school, and finishing law school, I actually did a legal master's in human rights and humanitarian law. Now, I would say, 
in terms of substance matter, what I use every day is what I got in my in my legal master's, not in my in my in my initial law degree. And in fact, the LLM in human rights and humanitarian law is one of the few LLMs where you don't need a law degree and don't need to be qualified in a specific uh, country context in order to take that LLM. So I, I actually recommend to a lot of um, people interested in doing this kind of work, go straight to the LLM, skip law school if you really are sure that you don't want to practice in a specific country. Um, you know, one, the only course I think on, in my legal master's where you needed to have a law degree in order to take it was international criminal law. But everything else, I mean, it, it's its own legal regime. It's its own legal system. And that's something that you, you learn and, and you can learn wh whether or not you did, you did an initial law degree. Um, I have a little bit of a different answer. But so my undergrad, I spent like 80% of my time just like be, being an activist on all sorts of different issues and like working on, you know, uh, issues in the Middle East. So that was my undergraduate education mostly. Um, when I was a master, I did a master's in, um, in, in Arab studies. Um, and for me, the reason for doing that was I didn't want to wake up. I knew I was going to dedicate my life to human rights. And I knew that the Middle East would be a core part of it, not out of a universal vision of human rights, but knowing that my background and language skills gave me a platform to have more impact. And I didn't want to wake up in 40 years and realize that I approached things the wrong way. So not only did I live, you know, a life where I didn't make maybe as much as I could have, or I was working in different conditions, but I approached it all wrong. So I was quite glad that I took two years where it was really a degree about modern economics, politics, social issues, and, and, and having the chance to be in a space to just think about the region was, was valuable. And then for me, doing a, I did a JD also in, in the U.S., and that was um, a law degree, and that was super valuable because, um, in particular, the clinical training. So I worked in a, in a law clinic, for those that aren't familiar, and um, in the United States and increasingly in Europe, um, just like you're in sort of a clinic as a doctor where you practice different um, rotations, you can be in a clinical setting where you provide pro bono um, legal work uh, in different parts of the law. And at the law school, when I got there, they actually had somebody who was formerly at Human Rights Watch who ran um, the clinic very much like Human Rights Watch. So, you know, we went to Pakistan at the time and we were documenting the effect of U.S. drone strikes um, on uh, communities in the tribal areas of Pakistan. I went at the time to Southeast Turkey to, to do work around the Kurdish situation with the Turks. Um, so that experience was 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 incredible for me because I um, was doing real human rights work. We wrote a report. My um, mentor at the time allowed me to do media interviews and speaking engagements on it, and I loved it. And so I was fortunate enough to get a fellowship at Human Rights Watch right out of law school. So for me, that would have 100% been not possible, you know, without uh, without that uh, thing. But so the second part, and I agree on Arabic and, and everything. If or if you have a region in mind, or if you have a thematic area, having that specialized knowledge. So if you're interested in women's rights, you know, really knowing that world. Um, and I felt I had that skill set. I had the Middle East background plus the legal set of tools. And I've tried to merge those together. Uh, I, I would love to have had more class on like photo and video and because that's increasingly in our line of work, uh, super important. And I'm, you know, not my, I, I've had to learn <laughs> that kind of those skills. Good. I think there was a question there also, there in the corner. Yeah, my question is for Omar, um, and it's addressing the priority of uh, Human Rights Watch in um, uh, foreign businesses doing business with Israeli settlements in, in one way or another. So uh, some of these settlements, they're kind of like cities, uh, very big places with universities and a whole economic ecosystem. Yeah. Many Palestinians, West Bank Palestinians, find employment there. Yeah. And they earn twice as much as they may in Palestinian businesses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if if all foreign business would stop dealing with settlements, those people might, might lose their job and their wages and so on. So what's the bigger picture there for as far as Human Rights Watch is concerned? You know, how do you balance those situations? Sure. That's a good question. Um, and I think that's part of the reason we focus on settlements is they're so entrenched. I mean, a settlement is a war crime. It's a transfer of one civilian's population to territory acquired by war, right, which is, you know, straight out of the Geneva Conventions. And the reason why Palestinians have to go work in settlements is because so much of the West Bank has been, their land has been confiscated. They've lost access to their natural resources. You know, many are not able to, uh, for example, work in farming and other sectors because of the effects of settlements. And Palestinians who work, Work 
in settlements are subjected to a different legal regime. Imagine a Palestinian Israeli who work in the same settlement business and Israeli is treated under Israeli civil law. So when it comes to like minimum wage, when it comes to fair labor conditions, they're under Israeli civil law. A Palestinian working at the exact same factory is treated under military or Jordanian law. So imagine in the same factory, two different legal regimes, depending on whether or not you're Palestinian or Israeli, right? In any system, you have to weigh comparative moral costs, right? And I don't mean to say this is the same thing, just for those I want to quote, but, you know, slavery in the United States, slaves had shelter. They had a roof to live under, and they lost that when slavery ended, right? I mean, the reality is you always are weighing comparative costs, but when you talk about settlements, they're at the root of a system that is so deeply endemically responsible for long-term um, rights abuse. I mean, for, two, for 52 years, Palestinians have not had basic civil rights. There are military order from 1967 that says, you, you know, your association, you can't associate with certain groups. You can't demonstrate as more than 10 people, right? Imagine 52 years without basic civil rights, right? I mean, a person who's 52 today has never had civil rights if they're a Palestinian that's grown up in the West Bank. It's the same thing with the ability to move and checkpoints, right? My colleague who covers, our colleague who covers Gaza, until a year ago, 32-year-old woman, until a year ago had never left the 40 by 11 kilometer Gaza Strip. And the only way you're going to deal with those issues is to go to the heart of the, the rights abuse, whether in Gaza it's the closure or whether in the West Bank it's the existence of settlements. And so it might seem, I, your question comes from a good place because I know it, it, like, you know, I mean, after talking about child marriage, you talk about like Airbnb having listings, it seems like a different scale, but it actually comes back to the deeper point, which is there are different types of issues and they require different solutions. So although Airbnb and booking are not the ones with the bulldozer that are demolishing a Palestinian home, they're at the very end of a structure that exists there. But sometimes the way to have impact and change is to go there because the other ones clearly aren't moving. Okay. Was, was that a good enough answer to your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think we have time for one or two more questions. <clears throat> My question is to um, Belkis. So what are the current advocacy priorities for Human Rights Watch in Iraq. Um, and my second question um, is related to the compensation law and practices in Iraq that are highly dysfunctional and corrupt. And victims of airstrikes find it very difficult to be compensated for their losses. And it's also sort of still being used by, coalition, by the coalition and coalition countries um, as an excuse not to compensate victims of airstrikes that they were responsible for. Do you see any opportunities for Human Rights Watch to work on that issue or, yeah. Um, so, so as I alluded to um, at one point in the discussion, a, a big part of the work over the last year and a half has been monitoring the prosecution of ISIS suspects. And um, uh, the, the scale of these prosecutions is astounding. So you have 19,000 men and boys who are being prosecuted for affiliation with ISIS. A small number of them are probably um, fighters who did very, 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 very serious things, including committed war crimes, held women as sex slaves, et cetera. Um, the vast majority of them, and I say this anecdotally based on the many trials that I've sat in on, are people who had no specific link or sympathy to the group, and all that their crime was, was continuing with their jobs once ISIS took over their areas. So a nurse working in a hospital that was then taken over by ISIS, he kept going to work because he thought that was his moral imperative to do so, and now he has been prosecuted and convicted under the counterterrorism law. Um, the, the prosecutions are fundamentally problematic from that perspective, from the way that the law deals with these cases. There are also you know, thing, problems within the due process of these cases, so no actual rights to a proper legal defense, no presumption of innocence. So on the defendant's rights, the, the, there are very serious problems, but I think more difficult to stomach, perhaps, are on the sides of the victims. You have victims who lived through sexual slavery. You have victims of the most serious atrocities uh, many of us will ever have seen in our lifetime. And they are faced with an Iraqi legal system that is not interested in them and their perspective whatsoever. It is interested in a five-minute trial that deals with the backlog of these 19,000 individuals and ideally, as far as they can, they can prefer, give the death penalty as quickly as possible and move on. That's the way justice looks today. And um, for those of you that were here at the video last night, Nadia Murad, a victim of sexual violence, she's still alive. She knows 
knows the person who held her and abused her. She deserves her day in court, and victims in Iraq are not getting that. So that's a key priority in our work. The second part of the work, which is intrinsically linked to this, is these 19,000 men and boys that are in prison, all of them has fa have family members. The women and the children who have loved ones who are thought to have joined ISIS are being ostracized by local society, by the federal government. They're being rounded up against their will. They're being held in camps, camps that were built by the United Nations to deal with the fighting and, the, and, and people displaced by that fighting. And they're being held as prisoners. And all of their rights have been stripped from them, including basic rights like being able to get their civil documentation, to get a birth certificate, to get a marriage certificate, no right to free movement. And, and so our role is really to focus on the fact that this is collective punishment, a war crime. You cannot punish a woman because of something that her husband may have done. Um, those, are, those, are, those are two very specific priorities. Just to touch on compensation, as you said, Iraq has a law in place since 2009 to compensate everyone who's victim of a terror attack or what they call a mistake of war. So the perpetrator is irrelevant. There, if you lost your house, if you lost your limb, if you lost your loved one, you get compensation. What Iraq has not done is actually set aside the budget to pay out this compensation. Um, so everyone who has applied for compensation since living under ISIS has not received it. And at the same time, as you said, the US-led coalition that did a lot of the, the, the bombing and therefore destruction and led to a lot of loss of life and, and property is hiding behind the Iraqi system and saying, Iraq is going to con compensate. They have a law in place, so it's not our job to pay. And that is actually something we are working on. Uh, we continue to push the Pentagon uh, directly on this topic because this is an issue of the US and US military because they are the leader of the coalition. But we also are doing this work with other with other countries in the coalition, um, with, the, with the Australians, other governments that have admitted that they may have killed civilians, but are absolutely refusing to provide compensation. Okay. I think we may have hundreds of questions more, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. It's about six o'clock, uh, time to close this uh, session. Also because uh, the rest of the program is, uh, is going on, people need to go to different uh, movies, for example. Thank you all for coming here. Thank you all for your questions and for your attention. Thank you very much, Belkis and Omar, for being here. <laughs> you were very honest and personal, and I also found it very interesting uh, how you were telling us about your, uh, your work. The Human Rights Watch weekend is not finished yet. It's continuing tonight, tomorrow. Uh, and if there's one thing you should go to, then it's probably the Dutch premiere tomorrow night of a Palestinian drama film called Screwdriver, tomorrow night at uh, 8.30. You're gonna be there, Omar. You're gonna give an introduction. It's about a Palestinian man trying to readjust his life uh, uh, after 15 years in an Israeli uh, prison. Um, Thank you all for coming and uh, have a good weekend. Thank you.